Good morning. It is good to be with each and every one of you this morning. We have an opportunity now to study a portion of God's Word together, and so we will step in to the living Word of God and see what He has for us this morning. I want to welcome our visitors who are here, some from afar and some from relatively close. We're certainly glad to have you with us. We appreciate your attendance here this morning. We have several members who are here now for the first time since this issue has begun, and we have been thinking about and worried about and, and concerned about our health and our well-being, and we have several here this morning, and we are excited to see your faces. This is powerful for me, and it means a lot to see you today. We face a struggle today, it certainly is not unique, but it is right in front of our faces. We as Christians today are living in a world where, for the most part, think about it with me, eternal truth is never brought into important discussions about good and evil. Folks in the world deciding, well, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil, is there even evil at all? The eternal truth of God is hardly ever, if not never, used when deciding these things. Facts and truth are perverted, twisted, and distorted by personal feelings, prejudices, and pre-existing bias. We, as New Testament Christians, have to consider God's truth apart from personal feelings, prejudices, and pre-existing bias. We know this, and yet it is so hard to set those things over to the side and say, what does it say? What is God saying to me now, and what does it mean to me now? Forget what I think. Forget how I feel. What is God's word revealed to me Today, Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 with me and, and we'll examine this together and we'll consider the truth that God has given to us through the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse 1 says this, But there were, also, there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Peter makes an important point about these false teachers of today. He says that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has bought them. That tells us that they are members of the Lord's church. They are walking away from God's truth, though they were once embracing it, and they are led away by destructive heresies that they themselves will teach. As we read through 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, we want to be looking for those words, destructive and destruction. This title is the eve of destruction, and yet I want us to see that he has said that the Lord has bought these men. Well, how has he bought them? How has he purchased them? How has he redeemed them? In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul tells the elders at Ephesus that they are to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so Peter says here, he doesn't separate himself from that idea. They were bought by the Lord, and yet they're false teachers now. They've been led away themselves by some doctrine or some other thing that's been taught that is not the gospel. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, listen to his language as he presents this idea in 1 Peter chapter 1 for those of us who are members of the Lord's church. He says this, You have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It is through him that you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, having been born again of incorruptible seed, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 23 is where that is found. He says in verse 1, These false teachers who deny the Lord who bought them and those who follow them will be lost. They bring on themselves swift destruction. That's why this is titled the eve of destruction. Men who say and do such things bring upon themselves swift destruction. Look at verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. And many will follow their destructive ways. Now the, now the warning's for us. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you. With deceptive words, they're going to use you through covetousness by their deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle. 
and their destruction does not slumber. Again, that idea, the eve of destruction. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. He's saying to us, their sentence has long since been pronounced. It is working right now, and in due time, it will strike these deceivers. Their destruction does not slumber. He's saying to us, the destruction that comes upon these men, it's awake. We sit in, in, on time side of these things and we think, well, where is it? How can someone be allowed to get away with such things? The word of God says, no, no, they're not allowed to do any such thing. They have willingly stepped away from the living word of God. They are teaching something other than the word of God. Through covetousness, they deceive you, exploit you, and use you. But their destruction is coming swiftly upon them. And we cannot forget about that. It is on its way and it will overtake them. Down in verse 4 of 2 Peter chapter 2. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah... <clears throat> One of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. There are three examples given to us here by the Apostle Peter. Examples of what God has done and will do to those who sin against him. Number one, the angels. The angels who have sinned are cast down to hell. They are reserved for judgment. Number two, the ancient world in the days of Noah were utterly destroyed. He brought the flood on the world of the ungodly. We know about that. We know that it's recorded in Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and into 9. Number three, the third example he gives is Sodom and Gomorrah. They were turned into what? Ashes. This people who lived in these cities were turned into ashes. Abraham witnessed it with his own eyes. Lot knew it very well because he lost his wife in the process. God has made them an example to those who would afterward live ungodly. This judgment, though it is restrained by God, will rain down on these people who teach such godless things and we have to be very serious about this because these things were set before us and we read about them so that we know how God deals with it his judgment though it is withheld now it is coming it is swiftly coming it is not slumbering it's awake think about the judgment of God awake and eager to move the pronouncement of God this judgment that God has already determined is it's, it's awake it's alive it's moving but it can't yet come because God says not yet. Not yet. There are precious souls in this world who have a decision to make. We can decide now which one will we choose, where will we go. We all have the word of God right in front of us. And we can decide what we're going to do with it. And so God says, hold on, wait, wait. And we're going to watch him. We're going to watch him work. We're going to watch him move in the remainder of this lesson to see how he waits and why he waits. Look at Second Peter with me. Second Peter Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. 2 Peter 3 and verse 1. Now the message to us. Certainly the first part was to us as well. There are going to be those by destructive heresies who say and teach things they should never teach. God's going to deal with them. 2 Peter 3, watch how it starts. Beloved, understand how the Lord speaks to you. Beloved, this is incur Peter's encouragement to those who obtained like precious faith by the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Peter's saying to them, I want, I want to stir something up within you. So, so we're listening to him. What is it? What is it he wants us to think about? And what does he want to be stirred up within us? Your pure minds by way of reminder. We see the word mind over and over again. Your pure minds by way of reminder, verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord 
and Savior. We've got to stop and think about what we're reading. He wants us to be stirred up in our minds by way of reminder that we would be mindful. Boy, I can just see it. I hope you can too. The Lord wants us to think. He wants us to examine what's been said and continue to examine what's being said now. I'm writing to you now because I love you and I want you to be mindful of these things. Verse 3, knowing this first, again for us, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. I want you to know this. Scoffers will come in the last days. Now we know two things about them. Number one is they scoff. They scoff at God. I'm tired of it. I've, I've heard all that. I read the Bible. I don't. It doesn't match up, you know, with everyday life. Everything just keeps going the same. He keeps saying judgment is impending. Judgment is raining down on those who teach false doctrine. And yet there are congregations of every sort under the sun that are worshiping today under some different banner than what God has given to him, to them, his living word. They worship under a different banner, and he just lets it go. I don't care anymore. I'm tired of this. So they scoff at God. That's what scoffing is. And number two, they say to themselves, and I want us to, to be mindful that this is not a person who would say this verbatim, word for word. But things just keep going on as it did before, just as our fathers were before time began. We're not looking for that language. It's a condition of heart and a condition of mind. These scoffers say to themselves, you know, the preacher keeps saying on Sunday that his promise is coming and we got to be ready. And I'm just worn out by that. He's not coming. Our fathers, our forefathers, our grandfathers, grandfathers, they lived through the same thing and heard the same message. And God has not come. Why would he come now? Why would he pick now? Why would he choose now? The world is as bad as it's ever been in my mind. But watch the conclusion of the thought of these people's hearts. All things continue at the end of verse 4 as they were from the beginning of crea creation. That's wrong. That statement's not true. Their scoffing conclusion is built on an untruth. Since the time of creation, the world has remained the same. No, that is not right. That is not true. Second Peter 2 in verse 5, he's already told us. God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. The entire world was washed away. Every living, breathing thing suffered death on that day when the rains came down and the floods came up. God destroyed that ancient world. So no, things have not been the same. God has shown us through this example that he is coming and that we have to be serious. Jesus repeats it several times. So as in the days of Noah, people were going about doing whatever people do, being married, uh, eating, drinking, rejoicing, participating in the activities of the day. And then it started to rain. And then they realized but they had before them a preacher of righteousness and they would not turn back to God. And so his judgment is just. Things are not the same. Don't ever let someone deceive you by saying things have always been the same since creation. No, they have not. The Bible's clear about that. And the Bible has done that for us so that we might be warned today to follow God and to serve him faithfully. Look at verse 5 of 2 Peter 3. For this they willfully for forget. He's going to tell us what I've just been saying. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. For this they willfully forget. The English Standard Version says they deliberately overlook this fact. These are people who are scoffing at the word of God and now they have come to a place where they deliberately overlook a fact that has been crystal clear to them. That God had held the first world together by the word of his power. And when he said it is enough, he commanded that the skies to rain, the, the fountains of the deep broke open, and water killed every living thing, save Noah, his family, and the animals that were on the ark. 
And it is a mark, it is a stamp for us to know that He means what He says. Do not deliberately overlook the facts that God has set before you. Because that world once existed, like this one exists, but perished by the use of water. Now down in verse 7, 2 Peter 3 and verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly. The heavens and the earth are now preserved by the word of God. They will be consumed by fire. That is a truth, an eternal truth. It has not happened yet, but we serve, honor, and worship a God who speaks of things that are not as though they were. He knows time from beginning to end, and he says this is the conclusion. When this comes, you be ready. Do not scoff. Understand these stamps of time that he's given to us in the past. Base your life on this truth and be rewarded by Almighty God. There's an interesting passage in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. We won't turn to it. Isaiah 43 and verse 2, if you're taking notes, Isaiah, by the word of God, mentions that God withholds the waters and he withholds the fire to keep from uh, inflicting pain, torture, and death on his own people. So, so it's the same thing. By the same word, God restrains these things, but there is coming a time when he will let go. And it has nothing left to do but burn. Everything will burn. Isaiah 43, verse 2 is the other side of that. That it doesn't burn now because God is keeping it from happening. He's protecting us. And he's waiting for that sinner who will come to the time in their life to say, I can't believe I've been in this mess this long. I need God. I need to be saved. God will wait. Watch verse 8, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. But beloved, it's to us again, those who are frustrated by this wicked world. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and in a thousand years as one day. No doubt coming from Psalm 90 and verse 4. A thousand years as it is one day. The Lord, verse 9, is not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, we know who they are. They're the scoffers who say, where is his coming? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a, there's a conversation here about time. And something that we have to understand about the eternal God and what he's doing with time. I want you to take this to heart. Time serves the grace of God. Time always bows the knee to grace. We take for granted this time that we live in. And it just keeps going on and on and on. Don't be mistaken about what God said to you. Time bows the knee to the grace of God. Time serves God in his purpose. He's not slack. He's long-suffering toward all of us. He's not willing. This is the God we serve. He's not willing. Yes, he sees the same things we do. Yes, he knows the trouble that we're in, but he's not willing. Judgment's already been determined, and he says, hold it, hold it. Not yet. God knows something we don't. There's someone out there who needs to turn to the Lord, and he will wait. What are we to do with that? Well, we're to praise God. He waited for me. He waited for you. It's easy for me to say, well, I was baptized in 2003, and it would be fantastic for me on that night, that Wednesday night, when I obeyed the gospel, that the trumpet would blow. Because I'm in. I get to go to heaven. I've done what he asked me to do. And yet he keeps waiting. And I keep living my life as a Christian, and I'm doing all that I can to do what's right. It's kind of a burden. I don't like that a whole lot. Is it wrong for me to want to go to heaven? No. What is wrong for me is to say, God sees fit to wait, and I'm tired of that. That's wrong. God sees fit to wait, and so I say, praise God. I've got to be looking for this individual. There may be someone in this room right now who needs to turn to the truth 
Someone who knows that, that they've been deceived by, by worldly wisdom, the things that man think and say, and they've bet their lives on. It's worthless. If you're thinking about this world and how damaged it is, understand that Almighty God, He knows that too. He's watching it with you. But Peter tells us that He's waiting, not because He's slack or He fell asleep. He's waiting for you. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The salvation of your soul rests upon the knowledge of the truth. And Almighty God, when He decides to move, when He says, okay, that's it. The trumpet will blow. And those who are in Christ, who are dead in Christ, will rise first. Those that remain or are alive in Christ will be caught up in the clouds in the air to be with him forever. That is what the scriptures teach. Those who do not know God and who do not obey the truth, fiery vengeance will rain down upon them. You have right now, we, all of us, we have right now to decide this. I want to give you a, just a brief side note that, that there will be a second lesson on this for the New Testament Christian in your life. What is it still going on in your life that needs attention? Because when he comes, nothing can stop that. We are warned, we are sufficiently warned, and we know the lives that we are to be living. We will deal with that next week if the Lord wills. I want to read something for you. Think about God, his grace and his mercy, how good he is, and what it should do for us. I want to read something for you from Romans chapter 2. Are you, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. Eternal life is given to those who continue to do good, who are seeking glory, honor, peace, and immortality. But understand that he will render to each one according to his deeds. My invitation to you is to examine your life now, right now, and decide where you are. Be sure of your standing with Almighty God so that when He comes, and may He come quickly, when He comes, you will stand ready to greet Him in the air, to be with Him forever. Do not ever find yourself on the other side of that. There's no reason to be there. He's told us what He's told us today for this purpose. Don't stay there. Come to him. Come to him now while together we stand and sing to encourage you. Yield not to temptation for